This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Gary Morgan. Gary has had a very interesting career and trajectory. He started out as a child actor in the late 50s into the 60s. I, I found out something I was not aware of. He was um, the original kid who played Rob Petrie's, uh, Rob Petrie's son on the Dick Van Dyke Show um, before it was even called the Dick Van Dyke Show. It was a pilot that they did with Carl Reiner playing Rob Petrie before Dick Van Dyke. Uh, I'm going to ask him uh, about that further. Um, he, uh, he is uh, best known for playing Grover Gogan in... Pete's Dragon, the classic Disney musical that I've loved ever since I was a little boy. He also played Billy in the space opera epic Logan's Run. And then he became a stuntman. He ended up doing stunts for a lot of classic horror and sci-fi movies. Cujo, Explorers, um, Alien Nation, Back to the Future 2 and 3. He did the hoverboard scenes in Back to the Future 2 and 3. And uh, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, etc. He's done a lot of uh, great, great work that we're going to get into today. And I just cannot wait. It is amazing. And, you know, I'm, I'm coming up on seven years sober and seven years of recovery from my car accident this Friday. And I just can't believe how lucky I am with all these great interviews I've been doing the last five years and all I can thank is God for this, and also thank all, all of you that actually listen to the show for the love and support you've given me over the past five years. So, thank you all. So yeah, here is my interview with Gary Morgan. So, going back in time, uh, you've been in the business since you were a kid. I was reading that uh, your mom had a dance studio and you trained there. Is that how your interest in show business began? Uh, no. No, it didn't. My, both of my parents had an acrobatic act. They were in vaudeville and theaters, and, like, my mom opened for Frank Sinatra in 1942. Wow. Uh, uh, after World War II, when my father got back, my mom and my dad did an act. My mom was with a different act. And then I was born, and I was on the road when I was five months old. I stood on my father's hand. They would throw me back and forth across the stage. And then when I learned how to talk, uh, they figured they could do nightclubs because I used to do stand-up with my dad, mm -hmm. you know, so we could do a little longer act. So um, I was in show business before I knew anything else. We were, you know, I... I I was on the road. We lived in a trailer, toured all around the United States, uh, doing an acrobatic act. Right. So your parents being in the circus, I mean, that must have been amazing, just uh, seeing the circus performed every night. Uh, oh, yeah. And, you know, we didn't actually go on the road with us, like a particular circus. We did a circus-type act. I see. We would do circus shows, um, you know, state fairs and uh, the Shrine Brothers Circus. But I was always around, like, animal acts, and, you know, I remember... It was with elephants and seals and, you know, uh, gym backs. And, <laughs> and then we did nightclubs. And, uh, and I remember we used, to do, we used to do burlesque theaters as well as, you know, the parents were the straight act for, for a burlesque theater. And when I was about seven, uh, somebody caught our act and they said, the kid could do commercials. You know, you should get, a, get him an agent. And they gave my father and my father goes, you know, hey, Gary, you want to be on television? I went, sure. So um, I got my first agent when I was seven years old and uh, started working. I was on Broadway and off Broadway when I was eight years old, 10 years old, and 12 years old in uh, three different shows. Yeah, aren't you? One of the, sh one of the shows that I did is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called All the Way Home, and I shared a dressing room with Jeff Conaway. <laughs> Jeff was nine, I was ten, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and years later, um, we played brothers in Pete's Dragon. Right. As you know, Jeff Conaway went out to do Taxi and... Uh, Grease. Uh, Grease, yep. Yeah. Yeah, and he was a pal of mine, you know, since we were little kids. Oh, that's wonderful. 
That's wonderful. Aren't you glad that you got to be a part of that last like run of old show business before everything went digital? As far as what? Like what movie? I mean, just I mean, just everything you know related oh, yeah. to show business. Yeah, like uh, I was in the movie uh, Logan's Run, right? And, and that was right before they went to CGI. All those sets were practical sets. They were all miniatures, but they had like one whole soundstage with the whole city in miniature. Um, the only big innovation on that, it was the first time a hologram was filmed. And uh, there's a scene where, right. you know, Logan is, you know, the, I don't know who's talking to him, but it's a hologram, you know, and uh, he's getting like information or something from, from a hologram. And it was like, whoa, a big deal. They actually photographed the hologram. Funny, huh? Yeah. <laughs> because of Logan's run, I was tested for for uh, Luke Skywalker in Star Wars. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, George Lucas was a fan of Logan's run, and uh, he brought me in for Luke. I had three interviews and a screen test, but I think I was too energetic for Luke, <laughs> not knowing, you know, what they wanted. I, you know, I've... Uh, you know, Mark Campbell did a great job, but he's very calm and introvert. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I was more like Han Solo than I was Luke Skywalker. I, I noticed um, one of your earliest credits. I, I couldn't believe this. It was, it was so amazing. You were in, in like the early pilot of what became the Dick Van Dyke show. Oh, yeah. I was in the pilot. Um, yeah. You could see it. It's called Head of the Family. Right. And it's the Dick Van Dyke show with a different cast. Carl Reiner was the lead, and uh, the Mary Tyler Moore was uh, Barbara Britton, who was a big Revlon mm -hmm. model. And the other guys were all Borscht Belt comics that were friends of Carl Reiner. Right. Um, so anyway, yeah, I was in the original pilot. When they did the uh, Dick Van Dyke show, when I did the pilot, I was nine, playing six. When they finally got around to selling it, I was 11. And I was just right. too old for what they wanted. They wanted a little kid, you know? Right. Which is kind of interesting because, you know, I was living in New York. Um, at the time that, um, that they did the Dick Van Dyke pilot, I was rehearsing to star on Broadway with Henry Fonda and Olivia de Havilland wow. playing my parents. So, um, you know, I was a working kid. And I would have to go to California to do the Dick Van Dyke show. And my mom had a dance school in New Jersey. That would have mean... You know, one of my parents would have the gun and, you know, years, I don't know. You never know, you know, how things work out. But that's, that was the Dick Van Dyke show. And I'm a friend with Dick Van Dyke now, too. And uh, I always keep it with him about, you know, uh, I could have been your son. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And then um, you were also in uh, Wait Until Dark. That was a controversial movie. Yeah, well, it was a very famous Broadway show. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't that controversial, actually. Uh, you know, it was about drug smuggling and a blind lady. And, you know, yeah. uh, it was it's a wonderful uh, show. And it was, I thought it was a terrific movie. Audrey Hepburn was great. I had a small scene sitting on the stairs uh, as a juvenile delinquent smoking a cigarette. And I, it's funny, I wore my Passaic High School wrestling jacket in that. Mm-hmm. So, um, anyway, yep, wait until dark. Yeah, I, I know that um, Alan Arkin hated it because of what he had to do with Audrey Hepburn in that movie. It was it was really tough emotionally to film that stuff. Oh, yeah, he was a real bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> and Alan Arkin is such a great guy, too. I later did a movie with him called Poppy. Okay. Which is a, a sweet little film about a... Puerto Rican dad trying to raise his kids as a single dad. It's a very funny comedy, and I play a bad guy in that too. I play uh, the leader of a Puerto Rican gang that, you know, that beats up <laughs> Alan Arkin and the kids. It's like, you know, my typical bad guy. Yeah. And then you were in the um, Burt Reynolds and Yule Brenner cop movie Fuzz. Right. Now, that's interesting too, because that was a director named Richard Cola, who just died uh, Christmas Eve. And, um, I did a little thing for him. He, I had an audition for him one time, and he said, looked at my resume and said, you were in comic strip? <laughs> I said, yeah. And he said, oh my God, I was, I was going to college at the time, and I, got a, I scored a free ticket you know, uh, 
from the drama department to see that show. And he gave me the part, and it was just a little part in some movie of the week. But mm-hmm. after that, he brought me back in to do uh, Fuzz uh, with Burt Reynolds and Yul Brenner. And my, the guy that I was with uh, was Charlie Martin Smith. Right. American Graffiti. He was the other kid, and we threw gasoline on drunks and lit them on fire <laughs> for kicks. And it was kind of uh, art imitating life because it actually happened in Boston. Uh, and, you know, the, the guy who wrote the script, you know, it was an actual event, put it in the script. Right. Then when it showed on television, Mm-hmm. The kids actually did it again, and they caught the kids, and they said, we saw them do it in fuzz. And I was like, oh, my God, I, am I responsible, you know, for that? It was, because like I said, it was uh, art imitating life, and then life imitating art. Uh, and uh, the director said, oh, yeah, I, you know, I took that into consideration. When I, when I made it, you've got to take responsibility for your actions. So, um, anyway... Yeah, and also uh, Charles Tyner from Pete's Dragon was in Fuzz. Yeah, I didn't have any scenes with him. But Burt Reynolds and I knew each other mm-hmm. because uh, my first job when I came to California, I did Poppy with Alan Arkin. Mm-hmm. And the money I made from that, I came to California because I had an agent here as well, just to, you know, just to check it out. Yeah. Uh, came for two weeks in the summer, and I never left. It was 1968, right after the Summer of Love. It was hippies up and down Sunset Strip. It was like, oh my God. I, 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 took, you know, I took a look at California and I never went back to New Jersey. Nice, it was just, um, it was fate is what it was. Yeah, but I gotta tell you, cause my mom having a dancing school, I, I learned how to dance. Cause you know, when your parents have a dancing school, it's self-defense, you better learn how to dance. And uh, my parents were acrobats, so I learned how to do acrobatics. Mm -hmm. So I got a job at Radio City Music Hall as an acrobat, a dancer acrobat. And then when I came to California, I used to pick up, you know, uh, I would say I never had to work outside of show business, but I did a lot of things in show business to keep me working. So I was like a dancer on like Academy Award shows and TV specials, you know what I mean? Exactly. Um, I was never a great dancer, but I was a terrific tumbler. So when they needed an acrobat in a number, I had the job, you know, because at the time, uh, everybody, it's different now. Now everybody does acrobatics. Everybody could juggle. Everybody could ride a unicycle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody does trapeze and circus arts are a big deal. But when I was a teenager, it was very, you know, small specialty. You know, if you could juggle or, or ride a unicycle. I mean, I got, I got jobs because of it. And my father once said to me, anything you learn how to do, eventually you'll make a buck at it. And damn if he wasn't right, you know. I got a job once. I could only juggle three balls, but I got a job juggling, still walking, uh, you know, and I had circus skills. And when I came to California, right away I hooked up with uh, a couple circus guys mm-hmm. at Muscle Beach. Muscle Beach, very important part of my life. Um, I met a guy named Ross Saunders, who was Gene Kelly's stunt double for all his movies. Wow. And he was also the model for Salvador Dali for The Christ of St. John. That famous Jesus on the cross uh, that Dali painted was Russ. Yeah. Anyway, Russ took me to an audition. I got this movie with Burt Reynolds. Uh, shot in Jamaica. I was 18, my first job in California, and the people that I met on that job affected the rest of my life and career uh, as an actor and a, and a stuntman, uh, you know, the producer and the stunt coordinator. It was uh, serendipity, you know, how you just kind of fall into good things sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's way different now, you know, that uh, everyone has to, like, jump through a lot of hoops now, you know, to, to get things in Hollywood. It's, it's crazy. Well, now in Hollywood, too, they don't care how much talent you've got. They want to know how many followers you have. Yeah. You know, it's really, it's true. When you go on auditions, yeah. you got to think, how many followers do you have? If you've got, a, you know, like over a million followers, they'll rather give you the job than somebody who's a better actor, you know, because your, your fans will watch. It's crazy. And people are making tons of money doing stupid stuff on, like, TikTok and... Uh, you know, Instagram, you could be a star 
on Instagram or on TikTok if you just do some, if you just catch the public's interest, uh, you know, just doing whatever stupid skits. It, you know, and people are making a ton of money doing that, as you probably are aware. Oh yeah, I don't, I don't get involved in that TikTok crap. That crap. <laughs> no, no, neither do I. I'm, t- I'm too <laughs> old for that, but for the technology. <laughs> but I'm telling you, uh, I've got a neighbor. And I live way up in Laurel Canyon. Um, mm-hmm. And him and his girlfriend, they're both 19. They're huge TikTok stars and make a zillion, tons of money. Yeah, it's crazy and it's frightening, too. Um, you got to play a guy named Joe Dante in The Student Teachers. <laughs> no, no, I didn't play Joe Dante. That was the director. Oh, I thought I, I thought you played the character's name. The character's name was Is my Joe. name in it? Because I know Joe Dante was the director. Who directed that? Uh, Jonathan Kaplan. Joe Dante. Jonathan Kaplan. Oh, that's right. Was my name Joe Dante? That was yeah. funny as it was. Yeah. It was, a, it was an end joke because that's what uh, Corman had everyone do, give, uh, you know, names of, like, you know, people who were working for him and stuff. That, you know, I never realized that was my name in that. The student teachers, how funny. Yeah. Do you did the re- sequel to it, too, uh, called Summer School Teachers. Um, oh, Yeah. With this uh, another director. Then I later on became a, a stunt coordinator for Roger Corman. I did like eight movies as the stunt coordinator um, right. for New World Pictures, Roger Corman's company. Do, do you remember working with uh, Susan DeMonte in this movie? Oh sure. And Susan DeMonte was was actually a friend of mine before that, and then after we were we were past, she was a friend of my wife's, and. Uh, God, I haven't heard that name for a while. She, yeah, she and I have become friends. She's been on the podcast three times, and she is such a supportive, wonderful lady. Uh, God, I would love tell her, tell her to call Gary Morgan. <laughs> I will. I will. I promise. Yeah, let's let's I, have a cup of coffee. I have connected her with a lot of people, so I definitely will connect her with you, Gary. Well, you know, that happened, too. I did a, 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 a podcast for somebody about Pete's Dragon, mm-hmm. and the kid that played Pete became a merchant marine and moved away and moved to like New Mexico and you know, mm-hmm. never did anything else in show business. And she connected the two of us and, you know, I got to call, uh, his name is Sean Marshall. Yeah. You know, after, geez, 30 years or something, we, you know, got back together. You probably talk about Tammy. She's been on the show too. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Tammy Tuckier. Yeah, she's she's wonderful. She, I love what she's been doing with the, the whole Disney uh, franchise and stuff. Yeah. So, so how did you get cast in Logan's Run? Uh, the same producer that did the movie in Jamaica with Burt Reynolds. Oh, okay. A, named so- a guy named Saul David uh, okay. brought me in because, you know, I could do my own stunts and bring action to it. And, and that's how I got cast. I was playing 15. I think I was 25 when I shot it. <laughs> and, uh, but that was Saul David. Um, the guy that, like I said, that, that first job that I got uh, in Jamaica, playing a missing link. He was doing stunts. I wanted to be an actor. I didn't want to be a stuntman. Yeah. Uh, but I would get a lot of roles that had action in it. And, um, and years later, after Cujo, mm-hmm. um, I wasn't getting cast much as an actor anymore because I didn't look like a kid. I was always playing, you know, young, you know, t- troubled teens and all that. Yeah. But, and I still didn't look like an adult. I mean, when you think I'm little, you know, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen pictures of me. Yeah. I, I don't look like an adult. Like, when you would, if you're going to count a doctor or a lawyer or a dad, <laughs> it ain't me. So that's when I segged more into the stunt department and uh, became a full-time stuntman. Yeah, the, 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 the only other stuntman I can think of who looks like a kid, too, is Bobby Porter. Oh, yeah. Bobby, I, I remember Bobby when he was just standing in for kids. Yeah. In, like, 1975, we did a movie for Disney called The Treasure of the Maracumba. Yeah. <laughs> Peter yeah. Houston off, who I also worked with in Logan's Run. Who was in that? Joan Hackett. Anyway, Bobby Porter was standing in for kids and then became a, 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 a quite a good stuntman. Yeah. I was working with uh, Jen- Jenny Agutter. Oh, I had such a crush on Jenny Agutter. Same here. <laughs> we all did. Everybody did. <laughs> she was such a sweetheart, too, in Logan's Run. 
Yeah. That's got a great cast. Camilla Carr, uh, Roscoe Lee Brown, Richard Jordan. A lot of good actors in that movie. Yep, yep. And then Roscoe and I were pals. Mm -hmm. um, through Martin Sheen. Martin Sheen's like my older brother. Uh, I did a U.S. Steel Hour in New York with him when I was 10 years old. And then worked with him, you know, as a kid. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, he's l like 10 years older than me. So, you know, when I was a kid, he, you know, when I was 10, he was 20. And... Uh, then when I came to California, we kind of re-hooked up and became close, like, lifelong friends. Um, yeah. The <laughs> Renaissance, I got to talk about the Renaissance Fair, too. Okay. Uh, the Renaissance Fair is a very big part of my life. Um, I went to it one time, and I thought, this is great, I got to do something. And I remembered a carnival game when I was a kid on the road with my parents. It was a rope ladder and uh, on a swivel. And I hadn't seen it since and i kind of remade one and pitched it to the renaissance fair and got in as a game booth and uh emilio estevez worked for me at mm. the renaissance fair sean penn worked for me at the renaissance fair wow um, <laughs> uh, rob Lowe got my junk tank one day uh to throw balls at him um to me more emilio to me tom wow. cruise used to come to the fair and I'm still doing the fair. I'm like a carny. I've got these carnival games. And for eight, seven or eight weekends in the spring, you know, I get to do it every year for, God, this could be like 48 years. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, Renaissance fairs are pretty popular, I have to say, all throughout California and stuff. Yep, and then I do, um, I do plays there as well. Both of my kids, uh, my, both my daughters are... Uh, actors and do plays at the fair and my younger daughter bonnie actually directs a canadia dell'arte so just for kicks we're all in this canadia which is the you know the italian comedy uh, with archetypal characters anyway and we do that every year great fun nice my whole life is fun i have a great a great fun life i've got to do fun things with really interesting people and it's still going on I know. Tell, tell, tell me about Peace Dragon, though. Like, I, I heard you say in Tammy's interview, you originally uh, brought on to do something else, and then you ended up playing Grover, right? Yeah. Uh, I auditioned for, uh, just as a dancer, and being an mm -hmm. acrobat, you know, um, they call them skeleton dancers. They get a skeleton crew of about six or eight people. And months before a movie goes into production because they're choreographing all the, the, you know, the scenes and all of that. And I was, you know, you do all the, you do all the dances, the kids, you know, everybody, and then teach it to the stars. You know what I mean? As, yeah. as they bring the stars in. So I know all the dances because, you know, I was with, worked with a choreographer. So they were auditioning Grover and I forgot the brother's name. Um, uh, um, how do I play I'll look it up. And I had worked for Disney, and I was going, come on, man, let me play one of the brothers. And the casting director would go, no, they want two oxen of men. Both guys have to be huge, and that ain't you. So <laughs> I was kind of feeling bummed because I was going, you know, I had done some really good roles, and I'm going, I'm back to being a chorus boy. But the money was good, and, you know, it's working for Disney. And I was on it for, gee, a couple of months. And as they were auditioning the actors... Uh, I was doing it in front, the routine, so they could follow it to be auditioned. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, there was a table with the producer and the director, the executive producer, you know, all the people auditioning the different stars to see how they, you know, do the choreography. And the producer said, Gary does it great. Let's use him. We won't have to use a stunt double. He could do all his own stunts. And he's funny. And we'll make it instead of two oxen of men, we'll make it like Mutt and Jeff. We'll get a big guy and a little guy. Uh, and they played that for the comedy. And they went, okay, you're not a dancer anymore. Now you're playing Grover. It was like a co-starring role. And that was another just serendipity that uh, the way it happened. Yeah, I mean, it's been my favorite Disney movie since I was three. We had we had the soundtrack on vinyl. We had a tape of it taped off of the ABC Sunday Night Movie. I mean, it's it's just it's always been a huge part of my life, and I just I still know all the songs. You know, I, I don't think the happiest home in these hills could be done in a Disney movie today because the lyrics are so morbid. <laughs> Yeah. If he cries out for mercy, you will just laugh. 
<laughs> you get things like that. Beat them, heat them, eat them for dessert, yeah! Roast them gently, gently so the flames don't hurt. <laughs> Maybe they could, uh, they could probably do that. They do some dark stuff now, let's face it. Oh, yeah. But I don't know. I mean, it just it, the, the the world is weird now when it comes to censorship. Who knows? But Who knows? Shelley Winters, I mean, she was probably her diva self offset, right? Oh my God! I gotta tell you. Well, she's dead, so I'll yeah. tell you the story. <laughs> <laughs> she was a complete diva. Yeah. You know, she she didn't even want to walk on the stage because it was too far to the set. She got she made him put her in a wheelchair to wheel her around so she didn't have to walk too much. Yeah. Uh, one day we were filming uh, the Happiest Home in the Hills, and there's like a stream and water and a mud puddle and you know, and it was all inside on a stage. None of that was outside. Well, it got very hot up in the, the fly floors where the lights are working, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The guys that are up there. So they always had the air conditioner on. And we were in the mud, and we were wet, and Shelly was going, I'm cold, you got to turn the air conditioner off. Yeah. So they did, but then they made her, for the, 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 you know, for the group of us that were getting wet, like a little, little area with a heater in it, like, you know, and we were you know, around our chairs and put us in there and put the heater on. Yeah. And then put the air conditioner back on. And Shelly goes, the air conditioner's on, I'm leaving. And she walks off the set. In about 10 minutes, the head of the studio, the executive producer, the director, they were all in a huddle. And they were saying, Kay Ballard, Martha Ray, all these other actresses that they could get to play it. And they actually fired Shelly. And uh, the director went, Shelly, darling, he was uh, Australian. He goes, Shelly, darling, you're, you're marvelous in the movie, but you're such a dreadful pain in the neck that we can't take the chance that you're going to pull this later on in the movie when we can't replace you. As it is now, we're all, you know, a couple of weeks and we could uh, be back on our feet. And they fired her. And she begged with them and pleaded, I'll be good, I promise, you know. <laughs> and, they kept, and they kept her. She was good for a while, but you know, but whenever she would pull any, you know, any crap, like the director just stepped in and just kind of, you know, strong-armed it all. Yeah. It's funny, because the director's dead, Shelley Winters is dead, <laughs> I'm the only Gogan alive. I'm one of the only people in the whole movie that's alive, except for Jim Dale, yeah. And the kid, I think everybody else died. Yeah, I, yeah, I think everybody's pretty much gone except for you and uh, Sean Marshall for sure. Yeah, and Jim Dale in the uh, Jim, you know, Jim Dale. Dale that played Doc Terminus mm-hmm. still lives in England and reads all the Harry Potter books for the uh, the audio books. Yeah, and he came from Broadway too. Yeah, oh yeah, he was in Barnum on Broadway that uh, my sister was in with him. His chemistry with Red Buttons was terrific in this movie. I can't imagine two other guys besides those two in this. They were amazing together. And a lot of that, Jim wrote and they ad-libbed and, um, you know, some of the scenes, they just kind of went off. And it was amazing. How was uh, Mickey Rooney? Mickey, I love Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney has got so much energy, though, and he's <laughs> exhausting. You know, just and he wants you to tell stories and, and look at me, look at me, and he's like, it's like a little kid show off. And he'd always go to the track, and he would never place a bet for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's like slip off. We go go to the track. I said, play the daily double for me. No, 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 don't bet on horses. <laughs> <laughs> I heard Helen Reddy once say that she knitted many sweaters in the trailer during this movie. She said there was a lot of waiting around. <laughs> I, I got pictures of her knitting. Oh, yeah? <laughs> her chair, sitting in her chair knitting. She was always knitting. While she was visiting, she was a knitter. Yeah. Oh, that's so awesome. Why do you think the movie didn't do well at the box office? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if the way it was released or... Uh, I, I really don't know. It came out in 77. Seven, 77. Close to 78. Yeah, because... I, I was I was shooting Matilda at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, at Radio... And it opened at Radio City Music Hall. And I happened to be in New York, so I got to go to the premiere of, uh, of it. Yeah, because I know this was pre-Eisen... Uh, 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 Pre Eisner and Katzenberg, and I think Roy was running the studio or, or something at the time. Just everything. No, no not Roy. Oh, uh, I can't think of the guy's name. 
Okay. Roy, but it was a guy, he was a former football player, but he was married to Walt's daughter, Debbie Disney. Right. Isn't that funny? Uh, I can't think of the guy's name. But Roy was around, Roy, but Roy really wasn't running the studio. This other guy, this other guy, I can't think of his name. Yeah, because everything they put out uh, was not doing well. Condor Man, uh, The Black Hole, The Devil and Max Devlin, just everything just didn't do well. And then once they, they formed Touchstone, then that's when um, it kind of opened the door for the, Dis the main Disney studio to start making money at the box office. Well, what happened was this guy was not really a creative guy. You know, Walt was an innovator. Mm -hmm. This guy was just... When Walt died, they just kept making the same kind of movies, the same way. Yeah. There's nothing innovative about it, you know what I mean? They played it real safe, and then Eisner stepped in and kind of revamped everything. I know. It's, 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 it's interesting. It should be a documentary. I'm sure it has, and I'm sure, I'm sure it, it will is. be. I'm sure it has. Somebody, <laughs> you know. So I've, I've talked to you. Well, well, Eisner and Frank Wells, they really wanted Frank Wells to run the studio. Right, because he was at Warner Brothers, right? Well, yeah, but when they offered it to him, he said, you know, I'm not really a good CEO. Let's, I'll be the president, but bring in my, my buddy Eisner to run the studio. And uh, the two of them did it. He didn't want to, uh, Frank Wells didn't want to do it alone. And um, I became very good friends with his son, a guy named uh, Eric Wells, uh, right. Eric Bryant Wells, because I did... Um, production of A Midsummer Night's Dream in Hollywood, and I was Puck, and he was uh, Oberon. Right. And so Frank was always coming to the theater, and then I got to be friends with him. I was I used to go to their beach house, and uh, really interesting, interesting guy, Frank Wells. Yeah. And then he died uh, in a helicopter crash skiing. Ooh. You know, um, anyway. That's, that's crazy. Uh, I've I've talked to uh, Dee Wallace about Cujo, you know, and she's told me about how horrific that experience was for her. But uh, how was your experience on Cujo? I had a great time, <laughs> <laughs> and it was. Um, I was in the dog suit. I did all the attack scenes. I did things the dog was too smart to do, like mm -hmm. can't teach a dog to hurt themselves. So right. when the dog smashes his head into the car door, that was me. And whenever you saw the star being attacked, it was me. When you saw the dog attacking somebody, it was attacking a stunt person or the trainer. You know what I mean? Right. But when you actually saw the star's face, it was me. Like, you know, you just see the, the head bobbing in and out. And, and they cut back and forth, real dog and me. And, uh, but I know Dee from before, because Dee was a Broadway dancer. Right. And I know her in New York, uh, when she did, um, like, this big industrial show, so... Uh, when we got on that, we were fast friends. I had a, you know, I had a great time. And it was supposed to be summertime. And it, we shot it, like, starting in, around Halloween. So it was freezing in Northern California. And uh, I was the only one that was warm in that dog suit. And they were all, like, you know, in short sleeves and being spritzed. And, you know, it was quite emotional, especially for the kid. It was like... Yeah, it made a great Stephen King movie, I have to say. Yep. You, were, uh, you did stunts... Uh, I'll I'll tell you a story about, about, okay. about Gujo. Okay. The kid got freaked out. It was one day, you know, like sobbing, and it like slipped into real. The kid was terrified. And the producer says to the kid, takes mm -hmm. him, wraps him in a blanket and takes him in. He goes, you are safe in the car. The dog can't get in the car. As long as you are in that car, you are safe, okay? <laughs> the very next scene. They had the window open just a little, just for ventilation, you know what I mean, while they were shooting it? Yeah. So the dog is on the roof, freaking out, like scratching, trying to get to them. This is in the movie. And the dog sees the windows open and gets his paw in the little open window. He's on the roof. The dog slips off the roof, and his paw opens the window, the back window. He hops in the car and sitting right in the car, like in the back seat. And the poor kid, I mean, he just said, as long as you're in the car. The next scene, the dog got in the car with the kid. And the, you know, the dog was just a big, sweet dog. You know, the, you know, the yeah. poor kid, you had, you had to scrape him off the ceiling with a spatula. Yeah. <laughs> and I brought that up to him. He doesn't even remember that. I said, oh, my God, I thought you were going to be scarred for life after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 Dee was scarred, but she actually embraces the movie now. Yeah, 
Oh, I see deal with how we do conventions together. You know, we're signing yeah. autographs for Cujo and stuff. She comes on the podcast about once a year to promote something new. I l- always love talking to her. Oh, yeah. She's a good promoter. She does a lot of stuff, too. You worked on Big Top Pee Wee? I doubled Pee Wee Herman. Really? <laughs> I, was his, I was his stunt double. So you did the tight, the, the, the tightrope walk? Uh, no, actually he did. That was not even a tightrope. That was kind of CGI. Okay. Uh, but I... Uh, I did the trapeze stuff where he catches and doesn't let go. And, yeah. Uh, and I worked out a lot of the stunts, uh, like on the horse. You know, I I rehearsed, you know, the people that are doing it so that when he stepped in, you know, I kind of showed him, you know, what to do. And he did a lot of that himself. Yeah. How about uh, Alienation? Alienation, I was the stunt coordinator on two of, oh no 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 alienation I forgot which one that was I was the uh, the stunt double for the alien kid mm. remember the, um, I don't know if you remember the movie but um, I do remember you know, certain parts the, of it the, yeah uh, the guys with the big kind of spongy heads yeah <laughs> you know uh, it was a teenage kid and I was his stunt double okay and then of course you did the hoverboard scenes in uh, Back to the Future too. yep all the hoverboard and all the research and development for the hoverboard scenes. We were on it for, you know, a couple of months before just to figure out how to make them look like they're hoverboards. I know. You know that, I mean? that was so groundbreaking at the time, you know. I don't think anyone predicted, you know, the the future of CGI and technology with that stuff. Right. And we did it all practical. We were on wires on a crane. And uh, they figured out that if you put the wires on, at first they had, we were in a harness and the wires were on our hips and they just, uh, you know, screwed the, escape, the, the boards to our, our shoes. But it didn't look like we were standing on it. It, it didn't, just didn't look right. So we finally put the wires on the board and then we literally just stood on the board and the wires went through a little ring at our belts. We weren't really attached to it so that we could have movement up and down and it looked like we were... And uh, that's the way we ended up doing it. Yeah, Darlene and Ricky told me it was, what, six weeks to film that scene? Yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> we, that was six weeks to film it. We did research and development for weeks and weeks before that, before we ever got onto the, you know, onto the stage. It was mainly, uh, a lot of second unit on that. Uh, you know, Zemeckis came in to do some of it, but um, a lot of the stunts were all second unit. Three must have been fun, though, with all the Western stuff. Oh, yeah, three was great. I doubled the bear in that. I, I, I do <laughs> animals a lot. I was the bear in the cave when, you know, when, uh, when Michael J. Fox, uh, remember, he gets chased out of the cave by the bear? Yeah. And then I doubled uh, Michael J. Fox just in a couple scenes because he had his own uh, stunt double. But second unit, I doubled, uh, I doubled him. And I got to be a soldier riding horses and chasing, you know, across Monument Valley. It, it, was, it was fun. And, uh... Uh, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. I doubled all three kids. That's the first time I doubled Ricky Dean Logan. And I doubled Brecken Meyer. And I forgot the other kid. The kid was actually the lead in uh, in Freddy's Nightmare. Uh, um, number six. Let's see. There was Brecken Meyer. There was Ricky Dean. And then the, I, I know who you're talking about. Uh, his name escapes me. Me too. But I doubled all three of them. Because they were all little. Yeah. So uh, I got to do all the stunts for that. Is Rachel Talalay a good director? Yeah, I, I, she was a good director. She was you know, very nice. Uh, I don't think she had a lot of experience when she did that one. But, uh, yeah, she was fun. Yeah, uh, I've met Robert England. He's a great guy. Yeah, oh, I used to run around with Robert England in the day when I was, we were both young actors in Hollywood. Oh, yeah, you see him at auditions and stuff? Yeah, just around uh, at a parties. And what's his name? Was in that too? Alice Cooper. Yeah, Alice. <laughs> Played Freddie's father. His abusive father with the whip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I knew Alice Cooper in 1968. Mm-hmm. So he, he used to rehearse at this place that a friend of mine owned called the Psychedelic Supermarket. Yeah. On Las Palmas. And... Uh, Alice Cooper, you know, used the back room to rehearse. And I reminded him of that. He's like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> talk about, you know, blast 
from the past. Yeah, you, you mentioned before about living in Laurel Canyon. Are there any more rock stars left there? Oh, sure. Well, you know, uh, I think Slash still lives here. Mm-hmm. Steven Tyler lives here. Oh. And, uh, and everyone, you know, uh, uh, Danny Hutton, one of the stars of Three Dog Nights. Oh, yeah. Is in the canyon. And uh, when I was, uh, my kids were going to uh, Wonderland in Laurel Canyon. Um all the guys on the PTA were all, you know, like, you know, Mark Volman from the Turtles, and all the guys that would, like, for the Halloween festival, what's up, were all, like, rock stars, former rock stars whose kids were going to, to you know, Wonderland School. Timothy Leary's kid went there. Oh, boy. <laughs> I was on the PTA with Timothy Leary. <laughs> <laughs> That is hilarious. Uh, yeah. did, did he say anything about drugs at those meetings? <laughs> no, no, but this is funny. Um, we were producing a Halloween festival. Mm-hmm. A Hall- yeah, a Halloween festival. No, 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 no. We did that. This is a Christmas festival uh, for the school. And me and Danny Hutton's wife used to put on all these things. And um, all the parents would, you know, man the booths. You know, whatever it was, you know, at these... It was, a, it, was a, it was a elementary school festival. So Timothy Leary signed up to sell chestnuts. Yeah. <laughs> and my wife is an artist, and she was assigned to make signs for all the booths, you know, like you know, whatever it was, you know, yeah. a dollar for this. Or, so she made a sign for Timothy Leary that had a big L that said luscious and a big S that said sensational and a big D that said delicious. So the LSD, like luscious, sensational, delicious chestnuts. <laughs> <laughs> she made that side of Timothy Leary. He looked at it, cracked up. He was taking pictures in front of it with the, with the parents. Somewhere floating around, there's pictures of Timothy Leary uh, selling chestnuts at the Christmas festival. Oh, that is, that is too hilarious. Yeah, I know. Back in the day, you know, in Laurel Canyon, you know, uh, I remember Alice Cooper and Mickey Dolan's like lived right next door to each other, <laughs> which is bizarre. Yeah. yeah, I knew Mickey. I used to go to his house uh, in the day. Yeah, they, they had a crew. They had like Harry Nilsson and Lennon whenever he was in town. They, they had the Hollywood vampires. Yep. Yep. I did not. I wasn't in that group. I got to be honest. I mean, I was uh, <laughs> around it, but that was, you know, the, the kind of the rock stars. Yeah. So, uh, are, so aside from the Renaissance Fair, are you mostly retired these days? Mm, yes and no. I, you know, I used to always go every time I finish a job, I go and retired, and then every time I get hired again, I come out of retirement. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a couple of jobs this year. At my age, I don't want to hit the ground hard anymore. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Uh, I, I've done it. <laughs> my wife keeps going. You know, tell them no. I want you to be able to pick up your grandchild. Yeah, well, I... <laughs> but, I'm retired, yeah, but like every time I get a job, I'll come out of retirement and do it. And, but, you know, the whole COVID thing is just no fun right now. I got to tell you, even on the set, you, know, you got to be, everybody's so careful and, you know, get to hang out. And yeah. It's just not fun right now. I know it's it's crazy, and I'll tell you, I've talked to a lot of stunt men. There are still st- uh, stunt men who are, you know, way past, you know, senior citizen age who are out there still doing it, and they just they want to do it until they die on set, which is bizarre. But it's 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 great that they're they're dedicated to their passion, you know. Yeah, but I gotta say, they don't hire the real old guys to hit the ground. I mean, you know, you do car stuff, and but <laughs> yeah. nobody wants to hurt the old guys. Yeah. Do you think maybe if you hadn't had the show business upbringing that you had, you probably would have, um, you know, uh, d- did what they did, you know, just keep on doing it till now. And, you know, if, if I, if I die, then fine. If not, then, you know, I'm just going to keep on doing it. Well, yeah. But like I said, you know, it takes longer to heal. You, you know, I personally don't want to, cause he, he fall down a flight of stairs. You're going to get dinged. You know what I mean? I don't care how talented you are. And uh, are you willing to to still hit the ground at an age where you're not, where you don't recover as fast? But um, a lot of stunts you do, yeah, a lot of them are death-defying. And things go wrong, you know, like even in the the hoverboard scene, you know, that when we crashed through the courthouse window, it kind of went bad and seriously hurt the stunt girl. Yeah. 
it's always a calculated risk when you do stunts. Yeah, or you know what happened, um, you know, a few months back with Alex Alec Baldwin, you know, with the with the gun. Oh, yeah, tragic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've heard lots of crazy things about stuff happening on sets, but nothing anything like that. I mean, that was bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. So do you know when um, your uh, Renaissance Fair is going to go on this year? I don't know yet. If it does, it'll be in the spring. It'll be in April, uh, you know, in uh, Irwindale, at the, um, just past Pasadena. It's at the Santa, Fe, uh, the Santa Fe Dam Recreation Center. If it happens, it didn't for two years already because of COVID. So um, hope hope it'll go on. Right now it's still up in the air. Nice. Well, I hope it does go on for you, Gary. And I want to thank you so much for coming on tonight. And uh, you just, you've been so delightful. You're a very sweet man and a very lucky man. And I am uh, truly honored. Well, I got to tell you too, I married the love of my life at an early age. I'm still married to her 48 years. Congrats. Uh, I mean, we were living together and I became a Jesus freak in the early Jesus movement. And I went, <laughs> I think we're supposed to be married. <laughs> and uh, we both got married and raised both of our kids in the business uh, and, you know, with Jesus at the center of our marriage. And I live in a castle on top of the hill and uh, just had a, a, an idyllic, magical life. And I still am having it. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, you stay safe, Gary, and thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Nice you, talking to you. You have a great night. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Gary Morgan. Ah, oh, what a great man, huh? I enjoy talking to him. All those great stories. That was hilarious. He was on the PTA with Timothy Leary, of all people. That is just so awesome. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Fire, dudes.